form is base details by Siegfried Sassoon. It's a very famous World War One poem, and what we're going to do with this is we're going to do a deep dive and analyze this poem, looking at themes, tones, images, key lines, and of course, most importantly, what it all means put together. So first of all, we'll start off with a reading of the poem itself. If I were fierce and bald and short of breath, I'd live with scarlet majors at the base and speed glum heroes up the line to death. You'd see me with my puffy, petulant face, guzzling and gulping in the best hotel, reading the roll of honour. Poor young chap, I'd say. I used to know his father well. Yes, we've lost heavily in this last scrap. And when the war is done and you stone dead, I toddle safely home and die in bed. So again, a lot of harsh sounds, harsh images. And what we can see already in this poem on initial first reading is that there's no punches pulled. It's very critical. It's very harsh. Even the use of words here. Look at the alliteration. Like puffy, petulant. That hard P sound. It's closely followed then by the idea of guzzling and gulping. So again, more alliteration, but this time the alliteration comes with the hard G. So what does that all mean? So what we have to do is we have to go back and look at the name of the poem, base details. And what we see here with the word base is the base is what's known as a double entendre. Or in other terms, people, it's a pun. So this double entendre is a word with more than one meaning. So, in the title, the word base represents a military base because, again, this poem is about world wars. And in this case, World War I. And especially Siegfried Sassoon, he's a war poet. But here's the pun. Here's the double entendre. Base also means the bottom. So in this case, base represents the poorly treated soldiers. So the way to remember this, when we talk about base, is we're looking at the word basic. So the bottom of the barrel, the everyday soldiers, those who don't have a chance, those who don't come from the higher or upper classes. And in the poem then, the well-off life of a major, so we see our typo here. So the well-off life of a major is compared to the horrific life of a World War I soldier. So we're looking at a contrast. And within that contrast, we're also looking at the idea of the rich people, the upper class, as in the officers, who are the majors here in this case, versus the poor. The poor men who are told they're doing their duty. And unfortunately, dying on the front line of war. Because of it. Now... What we also do here is, to understand this poem a bit better, we'll go into the life of Siegfried Sassoon. So, the first thing you're doing if you're writing a poem or an answer about any poet or his poems, it's essential to know their background, their life details, because it gives you a greater understanding of what they're interested in, how their themes relate to their life stories, or again, can the poem reflect on personal experience. With Siegfried Sassoon, it is very literal. He is a war poet. He suffered in the horrors of the First World War. He saw firsthand what it was like. Sassoon was a gallant officer who won the military cross for courage and fought at several battles. Yet he also detested the slaughter and the misconduct of the war by the generals and the politicians. Those, again, in the upper class who should know better, whose idea should be to protect the people, the lowest in society. But his protests were his poems. So it's the idea of using art to reach people and to protest. And in this took two forms. He had a statement where he spoke out against the war, which was quite famous and quite celebrated, which was published in the Times of London. But he also had these satirical war poems. Now, as well as that, Sassoon himself came from a relatively wealthy family. And this is important again. He studied at Cambridge and because he came from this well-off family, he was able to go through life originally without a job, without a profession. He was a man of leisure and he devoted himself to upper class 
pursuits like hunting and riding and cricket. But also, because of education, and he was wealthy and he had the time to enjoy it and study it, he studied poetry. And he published this at his own expense. Because he had the money, he didn't need to find a publisher. So he was self-published. So he had a way of financing and getting his work out there. And when World War I eventually kicked off and came around, he quickly volunteered and became an officer in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. So his war diary, though, retells us about his experiences of the front line and what it was like being in this war. And as you go on to study history or as you go on continuing either your war poems or you're studying English literature, there was no war in human history quite like World War I. It went on for four years. The famous tagline was that people who went were told it was an adventure and they'd be home by Christmas. But again, new things like trench warfare and the ideas of the new technologies slowed this war down compared to the traditional fighting on the battlefields. So that's why it went then till 1918. So what Sassoon tells us from his diary entries is just how bad it was on the front line. He had these primary first-hand accounts. In one account from 1916, he tells us, If you search carefully, you may find a skull, which is eyelisk. It's grotesquely matted with what was once hair. Its eyes once looked from these detestable empty holes. They were lift with triumph and beautiful with pity. So while they were stuck in these muddy trenches, get, you know, being bombed away, being shelled, not making much ground, being stuck there for months on end, getting diseased... They also saw, quite in front of them, bodies deteriorating in front of them and turning into skulls and just bodies breaking down and disintegrating. In another one, he tells us then, in July 1916, his diary entry states, The dead are terrible and undignified carcasses. They're stiff and contorted. Some side by side on their backs with bloody clotted fingers, mingled after they were handshaken in the companionship of death. And the stench was undefinable. The rags and shreds of blood-stained cloth. Bloody boots riddled and torn. So again, no matter where he went in this war, you were surrounded by death. Unfortunately, it was unavoidable. And for soon, he was wounded and he was sent home in battle. In a London hospital then, again in his diary in early 1917, he tells us how the experience of war changed him. And how he had these hideous nightmares that will continue to haunt him throughout his life. And the diary entry states. When the lights are out and the ward is half shadow. Then the horrors come creeping across the floor. The floor is littered with parcels of dead flesh and bones. Faces glaring at the ceiling. Hands clutching neck or belly. So again in modern terms that's what we'd call post-traumatic stress disorder. Commonly faced by soldiers coming back from war. But this idea of death and destruction and, in a way, needless waste was constantly around Sassoon. And that's why he continued to write about it. So Sassoon's poems aimed to tell us the truth about the war. He particularly wanted to upset those bloodthirsty civilians who never saw what the war was like. And those who made you know, false glories to, about the war and made the war seem more heroic and more beautiful and more brilliant than it was. So he wrote constantly about his memories from France and hints also about the newspaper and how the newspaper liked people. He used a very plain, a very direct style, bringing in soldier slang. A pattern of sharp lines often leads to a knockout blow in the last verse. And this is exactly what we can see here. There's no ambiguity, there's no confusion over what he's talking about. Just in the same way, debt is blunt. And something that's unavoidable and kind of hits the reader straight in the face. He uses the language there in this poem. So there can be no confusion. And then that last line, I toddle safely home and die in bed, is that knockout blow, which becomes his trademark. So one of his earliest poems was called Died of Wounds. And it talks exactly about a dying soldier in a hospital. And again, he tells other short stories and poems like the hero talking about how the soldiers were the real heroes. And what becomes very apparent here very quickly and is the whole basis for base details is Sassoon resented those who directed the fighting and took no active part in it. In other words, the generals and the majors who weren't involved in the war 
who are involved in the decision making but were far away and safe. So when Sassoon had time off and he was in a city called Rouen, R O U E N, by Normandy in France, he caught a couple of senior officers eating a very expensive meal in an expensive restaurant. And Sassoon talked to himself, hold on, this isn't quite right. We're getting blown to bits and diseased and dying here. There's going to be thousands of young men killed in a muddy field miles and miles away. And here are the ones who are meant to be looking after our best interests, making the right decisions, are sitting down stuffing their faces in a fancy restaurant, nice and safe and far away. So was this incident here in Rouen, which inspired upon those details. And this again was another satire and was built around two voices we see here, the observer and the major himself. So the first key thing you can see here is the use of satire. And this again is one of the first examples in the 20th century of satire being used to criticize the war. Because before that, to criticize the British army for by a British man was seen as blasphemous, was seen as something you didn't do and that you'd be unpatriotic. But here we have one of their very own soldiers who saw everything firsthand coming out and criticizing and saying, no, this war is actually wrong. So, and again, the reason we know this is because Sassoon left behind a lot of diary entries. And then another one in 1917, he tells us about how the staff army officers of the British Army, which he calls the Scarlet Majors, as we can see here in line two, sent men, young men off from the war to be killed while they stayed at the base, guzzling and gulping in the best hotel and sending glum heroes up the line to death. So like Sassoon's other poems, base details is bitterly sarcastic and it's derisive and hateful of the comfortable establishment that supported the continuation of the war, but showed little concern for the people who suffered its consequences. So there's a bitter irony here. Now, the team that we can see, and we'll look at teams as well, is obviously anger and bitterness. But judging what we can see here, there's also injustice. That is just not fair. It exposes and expresses, I suppose, the anger to those who start wars and send their fellow men to their death. The main message is that army officers plan battles from the safety of their base and are usually not involved in the fighting. And therefore, how can they know the horrors that they're forcing the soldiers to face? The first two quartiles here, and when I say quartiles, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So this is a quartile. And this is a quartile. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So the first two quartiles here, and the reason I'm showing this is if you're writing any essay or any answer on this, it's important to notice not just the meaning of the poem, but the techniques used by the poem. So mentioning structure and things like quartiles is just as important as mentioning stuff like onomatopoeia and alliteration, because it's done like that for a reason. So the first two quartiles are talking about the majors themselves. And it's seen in the sarcastic way. And then what you have here is this: these last two lines, one, two, is what's known as a couplet. And the couplet then tells us how the war isn't a joke, that the war is serious. So again, talking about how we talked about Sassoon at the start of this poem. He draws you in with basic language that you're gripped as reader. And then, like in all his other poems, the last line or two is used as this knockout blow. So the quartiles, they're angry, they're sarcastic, they can be funny mocking the mages. But then that last couplet, those last two lines, and the couplet here, as we know, is rhyming lines. Shows the serious nature. That these young men are going to be blown to bits. Or if they're lucky enough to survive. They'll never be the same again. After what they've witnessed or what they've experienced. While the majors will die like everyone else. But he's saying that they're going to be comfortable and in their sleep. And in other words have the best of treatment. 
which is hardly fair. So now it's important to go back to the satire, that this is a satirical poem, and satire then is defined as the use of humour, irony, exaggeration or ridicule to expose and criticise people's stupidity or vices. At this stage, or in this context, contemporary politics and other topical issues. So um, satire is still seen today, and you can see satire in the quartiles of this poem. So how do we analyse the poem now? So join me here as we go through this, bit by bit. If I were fierce and bald and short of breath, I'd live with scarlet majors at the base. In this first line, Sassoon shows us how he views the majors in World War One. They're angry, they're bald. He's trying to make them look as unattractive as possible. By short of breath, he means they are unfit. But the key thing here with unfit, unlike the young men, that they've never seen combat, most likely. So again, how can these guys tell them what to do in fighting or come up with tactics if they're not used or they're not experienced to fighting themselves? The Major knows nothing of war because he's never been on the front line. The Major is a figure associated with power and privilege. And he knows the meaning of the last scrap is how the Major thinks of war. That it's a game. The title of the poem is Base Details. So base does mean a military base. And details, probably another army term for a command assignment. But again, we're looking here at stereotypical World War One officers. So he doesn't put any personality or anything to differentiate the major into it. That they're all the same in the eyes of Sassoon. Lazy and they stay in the base. They don't do anything. So Scarlet Majors. First of all, he's talking about them being red-faced and angry. And again, the red face being unfit. Having temper, short of breath, not seeing combat. But also, the idea of the red coat that the upper class British military officer wore. So again, that's what we'd look at as another idea of a double entendre. And speed glum heroes up the line to death. So, it's just as we said, the soldiers have been spent to die. War isn't as glorified or as, you know, glamorous as they make it out to be. And hence we know glum. So again, glum, even the word is depressing. Glum, the sound, it just brings everything down. It's long drawn out. But again, they were told they were going to be heroes. But again, that's no way to treat a hero or any form of a human being. So glum heroes also refers to the heroes by that by dying they are unhappy. Up the line is what we, is the battlefield. So again on the front line. But also the idea of line makes us think of a factory, of a production line, that they're being marched dead, that they're replaceable the whole time. All the while the officers eat and drink until their hearts delight in the lap of luxury in the best hotel. This could portray the officers then as acting like monsters and this is what Sassoon intended. And that's why, as well as making them look like monsters, he uses these harsh P as we said. And the G sounds. The best hotel is the idea of power and privilege. means that we have puffy churlish face and will be eaten as much as he wants so again petulant childish so while the soldiers are being referred to heroes as real men the idea of petulance that he's a child they just stuffing his face that they do what they want it's an interesting thing to note but also, while this is all happening, we go back to Scarlet Major. And another one of the ideas of the double entendres is the image of red itself. So Scarlet being red. So this reference could be to the red blood on their hands from knowing they have killed all these young men and all these people by sending them to the front line. It could also, as we said, imply that their faces are red from being drunk. Because they've been drinking too much. That's a side effect of being drunk that your face goes red. 
or that they're very childish, which tells us that they're ignorant and will do anything to get what they want. Also, their faces might be red because they are so obese and out of breath from doing nothing. Reading the role of honour. Poor young chap, I'd say. I used to know his father well. And this is really an insult here. So the poet says that he would read the role of honour. And role of honour is what we call a list of dead soldiers, unfortunately. But he wouldn't show remorse to the dead soldiers. So he's showing how false and uncaring these guys are. That they lack this humanity is one way of looking at it. And again, poor young chap. This idea of direct speech can be interpreted as, as if it mimics how you know the majors would talk and how they pretend to care to get public opinion on their side. But it's just robotic and something that they say is routine without actually meaning it. Yes, we've lost heavily in this last scrap. So again, the term scrap. Scrap is something that happens as a small fight between two people or something that happens between kids on a schoolyard. War with death and bloodshed and millions of lives at stake isn't exactly what you call something like scrap. So the term scrap itself can refer to the generals and majors referring to the war as a game. And that's why youth stone dead. It really hits home here. Okay. It's a very blunt metaphor which shows the harshness of the author who isn't impressed with this. These last two lines though, and we'll go back to them here so we can see them properly in that couplet. And when the war is done and you stone dead, I toddle home safely die in bed. So these last two lines really hit home though. Okay. It's a blunt metaphor showing this harshness. And it shows that war is not just a game. And how young boys are being slaughtered for small, tiny sections of land. And when we're talking about tiny sections of land in World War I, it was a matter of metres. Not miles. Not towns. Not villages. Not provinces. Metres. That's how they're measuring it. And these small sections that people were dying for, they shouldn't be valued the same way as their people's lives should be valued. The idea of toddle... Okay, so that the major might be drunk, unsteady. He could be fat, again, on, on the shortness feet. But also, going back to this idea of child additionist, the idea of a toddler. Okay, so this toddler refers to the drunk major, and it's a very good example of satire, as it is effective in diminishing the normal view of a major. And this word here, die that's where it really hits home this word die is what Siegfried Sassoon wants the major to do instead he wants the major to suffer and die the way the young men are suffering and dying for their country Siegfried Sassoon shows great disgust towards military majors he's appalled at the way majors act while men are dying in the battlefield the majors are fat they're insensitive they're greedy they're vain they love themselves and they're very proud. And they have this idea that they display no empathy with the soldiers whatsoever. How could they relate to the men on the front line when they're privileged and they've been given everything their whole life? So this use of a regular rhyming scheme as well. It's another technique we can look at. So it'd be like a traditional poem you'd be more used to seeing. But this use of a regular rhyming scheme is interesting. Okay, because it helps create this tone of sarcasm. And as well as creating this tone of sarcasm, it's a welcome relief as well. Because looking at this poem, it's very serious. So such an upbeat rhythm would normally be seen inappropriate. Except that what Sassoon does very well here is he uses the technique to use that satire. And he's satirising how complacent the mages are who've never had to face the horrors of war. And that's one of our other major themes. The theme is war, and when you're relating back to your answers or any analysis, here's your evidence, gentlemen. 
and you'd stone dead. Looking at Tone, how could anything with war and criticism of war and leaders and death be anything other than negative? And the one other line you can point out there is a young chap. So again, treating these young men who've made more of a sacrifice than any of those majors ever would have, treating them as insignificant. Chap instead of 